On July 21st, 1861, forces of the Union and the Confederacy met in the first major battle of the United States Civil War. Called the Battle of Bull Run in the North and the Battle of Manassas in the South, the battle dashed early Union hopes of a quick victory over the Confederacy. But mostly what the battle did was illustrate to both sides that the war would be long, expensive, and bloody much less remembered as the second major battle of the United States Civil War. The Battle of Wilson's Creek was notable for several reasons, but like the Battle of Bull Run fought just 20 days before, it would illustrate to both sides that the war would be far more costly than anyone had imagined. The August 10th, 1861 Battle of Wilson's Creek deserves to be remembered. It receives surprisingly scant attention in the general study of the Civil War. It shouldn't. Missouri was more than just a divided border state. Missouri had been admitted as a slave state under the Missouri Compromise in 1821, a decision partly related to the early French colonial history in the area, but also largely to migration following the Louisiana Purchase in 1803. The state had become in many ways the epicenter of the debate between abolition and slavery, with the murder of abolitionist publisher Elijah Lovejoy in 1837, and the central role the state played in the landmark court case Dred Scott v. Sanford, which, among other important rulings, struck down the Missouri Compromise as unconstitutional. By the outbreak of the Civil War, the demographics of Missouri had changed substantially. Slavery was still an important part of the state's economy, and slaves represented nearly 10% of the state's population, but slavery was mostly restricted to the more southern and rural parts of the state. There was a notable abolitionist sentiment that was growing, mostly among the newly arrived Irish and German immigrants. But the largest sentiment was one common to border states, to stay out of the war. On January 21st, 1861, the legislature passed an act calling for a state convention to consider relations between the government of the United States and the government and people of the state of Missouri, and to adopt such measures for vindicating the sovereignty of the state and the protection of its institutions as shall appear to them to be demanded. The act stated that delegates to the convention would be elected by popular vote on February 18th, 1861, and were to convene in Jefferson City on February 28th, 1861. The purpose of the convention was simply to consider whether to secede from the Union. But the majority elected supported the Union, and secession was rejected by an overwhelming vote. Missouri was the only state during the U.S. Civil War to call upon a convention to consider secession without actually following through with secession. Rather, the convention preferred a different stance. Remain in the Union, retain slavery in the state, reject violence from both sides, and refuse to provide arms, soldiers, or material support to either. But both the Union and the Confederacy understood that the Mississippi River would be important strategically, making the large city of St. Louis on the Mississippi River a critical military objective. And the people of the state were deeply divided. Like other border states during the war, Missouri would find out that staying out of the war was impossible. Central to the state's position at the time was Governor Claiborne Fox Jackson. Jackson had run in the fall of 1860 as a Douglas Democrat. Stephen Arnold Douglas had run in the 1860 presidential election as a Democrat who supported popular sovereignty, the idea that each state should be allowed to decide for themselves whether to permit slavery within their borders. Douglas's position was, essentially, to prevent secession by the South by guaranteeing that the federal government would not involve itself in the issue of slavery. His message failed nationally. Of the four presidential candidates in 1860 to win electoral votes, he earned the least. But his message resonated in Missouri, the only state he won in 1860. To many, the election of Abraham Lincoln essentially guaranteed secession and civil war. But Jackson, elected on a ticket seen as one trying to prevent war, was sympathetic to the cause of the Confederacy and hoped to goad the state into secession. When the Missouri Convention refused secession, he began communications with the President of the Confederacy with a plan to seize St. Louis and, most importantly, the Federal Armory there and hand the state to the Confederacy. Jackson started raising units of the state militia, a right guaranteed under the Second Amendment of the United States Constitution. Ostensibly, the purpose of the militia was to protect Missouri's neutrality and protect the state from incursions by both federal forces and Confederate forces. But in reality, Jackson had appointed Confederate sympathizers to command in the militia and intended to use the militia to seize the city of St. Louis. Jackson had units of the state militia form around St. Louis to train Secretly, he negotiated with the Confederacy to provide the militia with heavy artillery needed to breach the thick walls of the Federal arsenal. But the plan was derailed by a commander of Union forces in St. Louis, Captain Nathaniel Lyon. By some accounts, Lyon, suspecting the militia's purpose, spied on them dressed as a farm woman. 
Having discovered the artillery, he led a force of pro-Union militia and U.S. regulars and captured the camp, surrounding them and forcing them to surrender. Lyon marched the captured and disarmed men through the city to the arsenal, where he planned to parole them and order them to disperse. But a crowd of pro-Confederate citizens became rowdy and eventually started throwing objects at the Union militia. Eventually, the conflict escalated. By some accounts, a drunk man fired into the Union troops, but other accounts say that the militia fired without provocation. But in the end, 28 civilians were killed and another 75 wounded in the Camp Jackson affair. While Lyon's action had saved the arsenal and possibly the state from Confederate capture, it also raised the state's ire. In May, the legislature passed the Military Bill. The bill reorganized the state militia into the Missouri State Guard and gave Governor Jackson wide power as commander of the Guard. The Guard was placed under the field command of former Missouri Governor Sterling Price and was supposed to defend Missouri territory from incursion by forces of the Union or Confederacy, especially an anticipated invasion by federal forces. The law also forbade the creation of other militias within the state to prevent the recruiting of pro-Union militia like those that had been involved in the Camp Jackson affair. Fearing that Missouri would side to the Confederacy, Brigadier General William Harney, commander of the U.S. Army Department of the West, negotiated an agreement that said, essentially, that the U.S. Army would stay in St. Louis and the Missouri State Guard would control the rest of the state. But the so-called Price-Harney truce could not last. Jackson, who theoretically swore allegiance to the Union and was governor of a state that had rejected secession, openly allowed recruiting for the Confederate Army and did not stop abuses against Union supporters. Harney was called back to Washington, and Lyon was promoted to Brigadier General and given command of the Department of the West. Minor battles were fought between the Missouri State Guard and Federal troops in June and July. While little more than skirmishes, the battles of Boonville and Carthage were unique. These were not fought between the Union and the Confederacy, but between the Union and the Missouri State Guard, officially under the authority of a state that had specifically rejected secession. Jackson himself commanded the Missouri State Guard at Carthage. A sitting governor had not commanded troops in battle in the United States since the War of 1812. These small engagements represented a unique war within a war. This was not a fight between the Union and the Confederacy, but a fight between federal troops and Missouri State Guard tasked with protecting Missouri's neutrality. But in reality, Jackson and Price weren't neutral at all. Not only were they Confederate sympathizers, they were negotiating with the Confederacy to facilitate an invasion of Missouri. But the legislature had finally had enough. Meeting again in July, they once again voted against secession, but also declared the governor's office vacant, in essence, exiling Jackson. Hamilton Gamble, who had been chief justice of the Missouri Supreme Court during the Dred Scott case, was appointed governor. By the end of July, Jackson had convinced the Confederate Army to invade Missouri, and Missouri State Guard camped near the southwestern Missouri town of Springfield. The mixed Missouri, Arkansas, and Confederate force numbered some 12,000. Nearby, Lyon was camped with some 5,400 Federals. Realizing that he was outnumbered more than two to one, Lyon planned to retreat to the city of Rolla, some hundred miles away, to await reinforcements. The Confederate force, now in the command of Confederate Brigadier General Benjamin McCullough, planned an attack for November 10th, but the rain on the night of the 9th compelled them to call off the attack. But Lyon surprised them in the morning with an attack intended to delay any pursuit of his retreat to Rolla. The attack came on a Confederate camp along a small stream called Wilson's Creek. It was the first major battle of the U.S. Civil War west of the Mississippi. The Federal plan was a surprise attack. Lyon would attack the Confederate camp at dawn, but he had detached some 1,200 men under Colonel Franz Siegel to do a flanking maneuver. It was a risky plan as it meant splitting a Federal force already outnumbered by the enemy. The two forces would be separated with no clear line of communication. In theory, the Federal forces, although outnumbered, were better trained and equipped than the Confederate force. At first, the Federal plan succeeded. In the confusion of their canceled attack the previous night, the Confederates had neglected to put out pickets and were caught by surprise. Lyon quickly overran the camp, taking the high ground of what would be called Bloody Hill. But a battery of artillery from the Arkansas militia managed to check the Federal advance, allowing Price to organize the Missouri State Guard and prevent a rout. Price attempted to retake the hill in a series of frontal attacks, each repulsed, with heavy losses. Siegel's attack also had initial success, surprising and routing the Confederate cavalry in the camp. But his force was taken by surprise. The Union force included an Iowa Infantry Regiment that wore gray uniforms. When Siegel saw a force approaching, he assumed it was the 1st Iowa, but the men were in fact Confederates of the 3rd Louisiana. Siegel's troops held fire until the force was almost upon them, and Siegel's flank collapsed. Siegel's force was forced to withdraw in disarray. 
The main Union force on Bloody Hill was now on its own. Lyon, who had been wounded twice in the heavy fighting, tried to lead a counterattack, but was shot through the heart. He was the first Union general officer to be killed in combat in the Civil War. While they still held a defensible position, Major Samuel D. Sturgis, now in command, realized that his troops were running short of ammunition and decided to withdraw. After a six and a half hour battle, the Confederates held the field. The Battle of Wilson's Creek was notable for a couple of reasons. It was only the second major battle of the war and the first to be fought west of the Mississippi River. Like Bull Run, the defeat shocked the Union, and like Bull Run, the defeat illustrated to both sides that the war would not be easily won. Despite holding the field, the Confederate Army had taken nearly as many casualties as the Union Army had, and short on supply, especially ammunition, and not having faith in the training of the Missouri State Guard, the Confederates were unable to follow up the Union retreat to Rolla. The victory essentially ceded southwest Missouri to the Confederacy, and it facilitated a victory as far north as Lexington, Missouri, but further defeats in October compelled both the Confederate Army and Sterling Price's Missouri State Guard to abandon the state, and a defeat at the Arkansas Battle of Pea Ridge the following March essentially dashed any Confederate hopes of retaking Missouri. Jackson convinced a small group of pro-Confederate delegates to pass an ordinance of secession in October, but the group was never recognized by the majority of the state. The secession government applied for and on November 28, 1861, was granted admission to the Confederacy as the purported 12th state of the Southern Federal Republic. The government in exile sent legislators to the Congress of the Confederate States, and Missouri was represented by the 12th star on the Confederate flag. Jackson himself died of pneumonia in December 1862. But Missouri remained contested throughout the war, and not just by armies, but under the particularly bloody and vicious attacks by and reprisals against the irregular forces called Missouri Bushwhackers. Counting small actions, there were more than 1,200 separate engagements inside the borders of the state of Missouri during the Civil War. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.